Yeah, so my work actually spans between New Guinea, New Media, and I also work in that exotic locale known as Kansas, um, <laughs> where, I, where I try to implement new models for education. So first I'm going to start off in New Guinea, though, and I'm just going to take you in. This is where I, where I work. I fly into the center of the island to this airstrip here, and then I walk for a couple days and I end up in villages like this, and these are villages that are really off the grid, you know, no electricity, no water, certainly no internet. And they grow all their own food in gardens like this. They also raise pigs. And they're also very opportunistic uh, foragers. So now and then, uh, after a big rain, the rain will wash down a spider web, and they'll be able to grab the spiders and the eggs, and they'll eat those. Every once in a while, they'll get lucky and, and capture a snake, and they'll eat a snake. And this particular snake is actually sort of the beginning of my research. And it seems like a crazy way to start off this, uh, this story. but. Um, this snake was actually found about 100 feet from where I was staying when I first arrived. So I walk into this village. I don't speak the language. I went just by myself as, you know, just trying to throw myself out there. And uh, I was staying in, a, in this house right over here. And I'll take you inside the house so you can see what it looks like. These are actually my legs up here. And we found this snake like 100 feet away, and we brought it in. We had a great meal of it. Um, but I was still pretty terrified of the place, and I was going through culture shock and all that kind of stuff. And so you can see my, uh, my sleeping bag here. I used to, in the middle of the night, I'd wrap myself up in the sleeping bag as tight as I could to avoid the uh, five-pound rats like Chris has discovered and also various bugs and stuff. And, but it's the tropics and it's hot and you're right by the fire, so inevitably the sleeping bag would come off of me and I'd be exposed to the world and there'd be bugs crawling on me. I'd brush them off and wrap myself up again. But on this day, the very day that we found this snake, I'm looking around thinking, gosh, a snake could crawl in here any time. You know, this isn't exactly an airtight house. And sure enough, in the middle of that very night after we ate the snake, I woke up in the middle of the night, and there's this thing across me that's this big around, just, just right across my chest like this. And so I freak out, obviously, and, <laughs> and I grab it with my left hand, and I, I throw it off of me. But as I throw it, I roll with it, and it's completely dark. I can't see what's happening, but clearly I'm wrapped up with this thing somehow. So, but I get it pinned down with my left hand, and then I try to move my right arm so I can pin it down with my right arm, and I, I can't move my right arm. And it's about this time I realize I've actually pinned down my own right arm like this. <laughs> and, and what had happened was my, my arm had fallen asleep, and then it just was across me like this. And so... So there actually was no snake, and, uh, and so then I had to explain with, really with hand gestures and things, because I didn't speak the language, what was going on, and f for the next couple months, I'd walk around these villages, and I'd just hear, they, I didn't understand the language, so it'd be like, blah, 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 and I'd hear, see these arm gestures, and then <laughs> laughter. And this sounds really funny, but it was actually devastating. <laughs> and, uh, and I realized I had to recreate myself, recreate my identity. You know, the worst form of culture shock is actually you realize that you don't have a self anymore. You don't really have an identity because you just can't communicate who you are to these people. And I realized I had to recreate myself. And in the process of recreating myself over the years that I lived there, it was... Uh, I, I was doing it in a totally different way than the way I'd created myself in high school. I, I grew up in a very mediated world, a very like media-saturated world, and this is a world with no media. And it really made me think about how different it is to shape your identity in a world based entirely around face-to-face -face relationships versus a mediated world. And then over the last 10 years that I've been going back and forth there, something else happened, and that was the introduction of writing in the form of maps, censuses, uh, law books, and Bibles. And this had tremendous effects on the culture, far beyond what I could have ever predicted had somebody told me writing was just around the corner for them. And this made me think that media are not just tools, they're not just means of communication, but media actually mediate relationships. And so when media change, relationships change. And that brings up some interesting implications for where we are at here uh, in our society with new media coming in all the time. So th I'll tell you the story of how I got started here. So when I got back from New Guinea, I started looking into new media in the US and, and globally. And I'll tell you a story about this. This is the million dollar story. So a million dollars is what it costs to produce a commercial for the Super Bowl. Just the 30 second spot for the Super Bowl cost a million dollars. So Doritos had this great idea. They were just gonna leverage this new media environment, this user generated environment to just ask their customers to produce a commercial for them. And then they would vote on the best one and the best one would be aired on the Super Bowl. 
and it was a great success. This is a screenshot from one of the, the, the winning video. And they asked the two young guys who did this, these are just amateur filmmakers, they asked them, how much did it cost you to produce this video? And they said $12.79, which is roughly the cost of three bags of Doritos that they had to break during the filming. And uh, that's a pretty good savings. It's roughly a million dollars in savings. I don't have the exact math, but um, <laughs> the USA Today did a study on it and found that it was the fourth most successful video uh, commercial that year. So it did really well. But it ended up costing, you know, it was $2.6 million just to get it on the air. That's what it cost for 30 seconds of airtime during the, during the Super Bowl. So if you're doing the math, that's roughly $2.6 <laughs> million. Um, and they asked them why you would do that, you know, and they said, well, it's all about water cooler talk. And they said, especially today with the internet, you want people chatting on the internet about your product. You don't want them talking about the game, you want them talking about your product, that crazy commercial they saw. Well, it turns out the day after the Super Bowl, the most popular video on the web, the most talked about video on the web, cost zero dollars to produce and distribute. And I know this because it was actually a video I produced. And it's this video here, it's a very geeky video. Uh, that is sort of my first attempt at explaining the impact of new technology on our society. And what it is, is it, it sort of documents the change in, in text as it moves from paper to the digital world. And I'm going to speed it up here a bit because you don't want to watch the whole geeky thing, but it is like a, what it does is it analyzes behind the scenes of the web. It looks at the difference between HTML and XML and the coming of XML and how it unleashed blogs and wikis and YouTube and Flickr and all these different things. That, and that ultimately all of these things add up to a very important change that the web is no longer about linking people or information, but it's about linking people. And I concluded that we would have to rethink a number of things as you'll see here in the conclusion of the video. But the real story of this video is not like the video itself that you just saw. It's actually the journey of the video. The journey of the video says a lot more about the world we live in today than the video itself. Because the video itself was actually made in the basement of this humble little house in the middle of Kansas. And it was produced in collaboration with a guy in the Ivory Coast who I'd never met until I'd made the video because he had uploaded uh, this music which I uh, was able to use for the video. Uh, I uploaded it on Wednesday. By Friday, it had 250 views. And the reason why a screenshot of this exists is because as an anthropologist, if more than 200 people read your work, this is a really big deal. And so, <laughs> so, I, so I took the picture and sent it to my department head. Um, and the interesting thing, though, is that by the next day, this is now Saturday morning, it had 1,000 views. And then I, I started getting excited, and I was hitting refresh, refresh, refresh. And the amazing thing at that point was that it was actually doubling every time I was uh, seeing an update instead of just sort of creeping up like this. It was a hockey stick you know, effect. It was just climbing up. So I went around to see what was happening. It turned out that it had been dug. Uh, dig is a site where people can submit any story or video or anything like that. And then the users can, can dig it. They can give it a thumbs up or they can bury it and it goes down. And there's a lot of sites out there on the web. Millions of people use sites like this. And it actually pushes the best content or the content that's most liked right to the front page. This is a form of what you might call user generated filtering where users all over the world are actually collaborating and in a way do the, do the hard work that an editor normally does, but they do it collectively. And so here you see it rising to the front page of Dig. It was also getting popular on Delicious, and Delicious is a site where if you're watching the video here and you want to bookmark it for later, you not only bookmark it for yourself, but you're doing a social act. You're actually bookmarking it and sharing your bookmarks with the world. And if thousands and millions of people do it, as they do on Delicious, they're actually sharing uh, their own, their, their way of organizing the web, and they are there, therefore collectively organizing the web together. So this you might call user-generated organization. And what's really interesting about this is as people are doing this, the moment somebody tags my video with Web 2.0 or anthropology, or in fact tags anything with anthropology or Web 2.0, anything I'm interested in, that's sent right to my front page. Not any of you who use Google Reader or My Yahoo or anything like that, you can actually basically have millions of research assistants around the world just by setting up something like this. And this you might call user-generated distribution. So now you can see that this is actually an alternative media machine that stands sort of, does a lot of the things that old media does, uh, but does it all by harnessing the, the 
users' actions. And then even things that yeah, you think you're not sort of helping out in this user-generated landscape, you actually are. So things like just simply linking to a video, those links are counted by websites like Technorati and Google, and that's what actually provides the search results and the rankings that you see. So then this is Sunday morning, you can see my video was starting to make its rounds and lots of people were blogging about it, and it was in the top five of, of Technorati, and so this is when I got really excited and I called my wife in and we were both then hitting refresh, 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 <laughs> hoping that it would get to number one before the Super Bowl because we knew the Super Bowl commercials would just wash it out. Um, but amazingly, by noon that day, it did reach number one and after the Super Bowl commercials came, it still stuck number one and it stayed number one uh, for over a month after that. So it really became this phenomenon online and it's, it's amazing then to see that this user-generated landscape, these millions of people working together could actually spread this video to millions of people, to have it be talked about uh, thousands of times. And so that this new landscape, what's interesting about it is not just the technology, but that it's actually uh, bringing people together to collaborate in new ways so that at the center of this is not just the technology, but it's us. And that means this is as much a social or cultural revolution as it is a technological one, which is why we need to rethink all of these things. And especially what I'm very interested in is rethinking this. So this is my class in Kansas. I teach 200 to 400 students uh, in these huge classrooms in Kansas. And what's interesting about this new mediascape is uh, that it's not just this, but if you talk to any futurist, they'll tell you that we're actually moving towards a situation where we'll have ubiquitous networks, ubiquitous computing, ubiquitous information at a limited speed about everything, everywhere, from anywhere, on all kinds of devices. Did you get that? <laughs> so, and uh, that makes testing like this look kind of silly because almost the entire body of human knowledge is actually floating in the air all around these students. And so, uh, and, and you know, the classroom itself actually sends maybe the wrong message, almost a counter message to what this new media environment they're used to and, and they're involved in is sending. So if you look at the message of this classroom, what these walls are telling them, it's telling them that to, that to learn is to acquire information, that information is scarce and hard to find, that they should trust authority, the sage on the stage, for good information. That authorized information is beyond discussion. That's why the chairs don't you know, turn to each other so they can discuss. That ultimately they should obey the authority and follow along. This type of learning is probably not the type of learning we want to create the next, you know, the next batch of emerging explorers who are going to make these great discoveries that we need. Uh, so what's worse, if you look at what students say in these walls, and this was the big eye opener for me, was you know, if you think about what good learning starts with, good learning starts with a great question. If a student has a great question, some question that burns in their mind, they will pursue that to the ends, right? And they're, they're off and running. You, you just have to get out of the way at that point. Instead, the types of questions that were being inspired in this classroom when I started teaching there were questions like this. How many points is this worth? Uh, how long does this paper need to be? What do we need to know for this test? And ultimately, I view this as a crisis of significance, that students are really struggling to find the significance of the learning. They're playing a different game. They're playing the getting the grade and getting by game, rather than really trying to learn something of significance and importance. So it's no wonder that a lot of our students would be tuning out of class. You see this, this is a big problem around America right now, that students are Facebooking through their classes. But there's another, I think, subtext to this. When you see students Facebooking in your classes, there's another message that's being sent, and that is, essentially that these walls don't matter. That if they can access information from anywhere, anytime, which is what they're doing on Facebook, it's telling you that these walls don't necessarily have to matter. And that this environment, which we view as very disruptive to the classroom, can actually be disruptive in a good way. It can remind us that these walls don't matter, and we can start rethinking how our students are doing their research, collaborating, and publishing. And when these walls don't matter, it means that you can basically collaborate with anybody, anytime, anywhere. You can find research on anything, anytime, anywhere. And you can publish your material out to anybody, anytime, anywhere. And so what we did was we just cranked up a Google document. This is one of our first experiments with this kind of thing. And this allowed 200 students to edit the same document at once. And we f focused on education at first, the, the classroom itself. So after about 400 edits made by all these 200 students, we had a really interesting document put together, which we published in many different forms, including a video we put on YouTube that got millions of views that was instantly translated into Spanish, Greek, Italian, French, and Arabic. Oh, it even got on ABC News here. 
And then the next thing we did was we thought, well, gosh, there's so much expertise here. If we could just somehow leverage all the knowledge that's in this room, instead of viewing it as like the sage on the stage, instead of taking a different model and thinking about all the intelligence that's out there, if somehow we could get all together working on the same thing, we turned our attention to the study of YouTube. We did an anthropological study of YouTube. That also uh, became a big hit. We made a documentary about it, over a million views. It was reviewed as, it's called a phenomenon in the New York Times. Um, this is all done by undergrads in Kansas. And then uh, one of the things I'm most proud of is we take a classroom like this, 200 to 400 students. Each student is assigned to know as much as possible about some world region throughout all time. So anthropology is the study of all humans in all times and all places, right? So in order to sort of divide up the labor of that, all, each student becomes an expert in some particular aspect of the world. And then we uh, divide up the world into 20 different world areas, and the students actually create a sort of realistic-like culture that would have existed as of the year 1450. Then they have to design, they have to think about how the world works, and the whole, that's the frame, framework of the class, how does the world work? And they have to design a game or a simulation that will allow them to simulate the last 550 years of world history, colonization, decolonization, wars, uh, the, global, the birth of the global economy, and so on and uh, the depletion of natural resources. All of those things have to be built into the game. And we, uh, here you can see what we end up doing. We, we abandon the uh, typical classroom. We meet wherever we can. This, this year we happen to meet in a rodeo arena because we're, we're in Kansas. And, <laughs> that's, and, uh, and the students build up this whole world. They build up a whole series of rules that are meant to simulate the world. We record it all on 20 different cameras, ran by students. We edit it all together, put it up on YouTube. And the purpose of all this is that it changes the question from what do we need to know for this test to the much more important, what do we need to know for this test? Thanks. <laughs>